Good morning. Um, I hope uh, you uh, had a nice restful sleep. Um, I try not to think of what time it is in San Francisco right now. Um, so what I want to do in this uh, morning session is actually discuss a, a, um, a bit. I know yesterday we talked briefly about side effects uh, associated with uh, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, some of the more common side effects. Um, but I think as we all understand, um, the amount of follow-up that we have to date is reasonably short. Um, imatinib having been approved 13 years ago, I had a conversation with a patient several, a couple of years ago who was uh, in his mid-30s, and um, I thought I was giving him reassuring information by providing him with what the outlook was for eight years of follow-up with imatinib. And his wife said, well, can't you tell me anything more about, you know, beyond eight years? Because in eight years, he'll be 43 years old. And she wanted to know about, of course, when he would be 60 or 70. And um, unfortunately, as with efficacy, our, 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 our uh, experience is limited in terms of uh, side effects. But um, this is an, obviously an increasingly important issue as people are living substantially longer. And we need to, of course, keep an open eye for late emerging toxicities, and uh, in particular, toxicities that can be serious and uh, irreversible. So. Um, in many parts of the world, um, in the United States, certainly, um, the frontline uh, TKI options, uh, of course, include imatinib, uh, but also nilotinib and disatinib. Um, and second line uh, and other TKIs include bosutinib and panatinib. And um, as I just mentioned, I think um, given that um, many of these agents can get patients to deep responses, um, it, it becomes imperative when we have options to try to identify agents that are going to be not only well tolerated from a day-to-day -day basis, but hopefully um, will not be associated with any serious and irreversible uh, side effects. So with imatinib, um, again, we have the longest follow-up of this agent. Um, as you know, this was approved in 2001. Um, most of the side effects do appear to be experienced by patients uh, early within the first two years. Uh, I'm sure you all know things like fatigue, muscle cramps, uh, musculoskeletal discomfort, and some of the gastrointestinal side effects uh, with imatinib. Uh, these uh, are some of the more common ones, uh, but they can be problematic, of course, uh, in some patients. Um, there are very, very few reports of serious and irreversible toxicity with imatinib, which is, of course, very encouraging. We have not learned that with increasing time on the drug that there is uh, a risk of late events occurring. I will point out that many years ago, it became clear that there were rare cases very rare cases of, uh, of fatal uh, liver damage. Um, these, again, are very rare. But it, of course, no drug is perfect, as I mentioned yesterday. Uh, and aside from that, um, this drug seems to be relatively, thankfully, clear uh, when it comes to serious and irreversible toxicities. Um, Desatinib was the next TKI approved. Uh, in 2006 uh, in the United States. And as with imatinib, most of the side effects do occur within the first uh, two years. However, as I mentioned yesterday, the risk of pleural effusion is not limited to the first few years. And, and certainly, people can continue to be at risk for developing uh, pleural effusions. And uh, to date, it seems that that, that risk appears to be uh, constant uh, over time. Um, there are some um, risk factors associated with uh, pleural effusion that I have listed here, including the drug trough level, uh, increasing age, pulmonary disease, cardiovascular disease, and hypertension. Um, the more common side effects, of course, that patients may have that are not serious um, um, and certainly not irreversible uh, are uh, acne, headache, uh, and gastrointestinal uh, discomfort. Um, now, pleural effusion, I will say, is also not irreversible. When it comes to potentially serious and irreversible toxicities with this drug, 
probably the, 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 the only thing that, that has come to light recently is uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, which has been noticed after uh, the approval of the drug. We don't know the absolute uh, frequency of this, but we estimate it to be less than 1%. Um, this appears to be largely reversible in most cases, uh, but it may not be completely reversible. So this, is, again, is something we need to keep in mind uh, in patients, and of course, we need to keep a vigilant eye for new toxicities uh, with this agent and with all agents. Nilotinib was, of course, uh, first FDA approved soon thereafter in 2007. And as with the other TKIs, it appears that most of the side effects are experienced within the first two years. The common side effects, uh, again, are, as you know, rash, headache, and gastrointestinal issues. Um, Pancreatitis and hyperglycemia can also occur in a small proportion of patients. We have learned um, more recently about um, some serious and irreversible toxicity, potentially irreversible toxicities associated with this agent. Again, after its approval, we've learned about these peripheral arterial uh, occlusive events that occurred at a, in both nilotinib arms with four to five years of follow-up on the ENS-10D study at a rate of about 7%, um, which was substantially higher than what was observed in the imatinib arm. Um, primarily, this was in patients with one or more uh, risk factor. I will uh, go into what the risk factors for this uh, are uh, in a few moments. Uh, of course, sudden death is something that had been reported in the original phase two study uh, with this agent. We think this is rare. We think this may be related to QT prolongation, which of course can be monitored, but we do not know that uh, that, uh, that, that is a, a relationship uh, for, for certain. Bosutinib um, was the next TKI approved in 2012. Um, and as I mentioned yesterday, of all the TKIs, I would say this is the one that we probably have the least experience with um, uh, for multiple reasons. But um, certainly the most prominent side effect of this agent uh, appears to be, of course, uh, diarrhea and, and gastrointestinal issues. Um, it may be associated with, a, with maybe a higher risk of uh, liver function test abnormalities than most of the other TKIs. Um, but in terms of serious and irreversible toxicities, we don't know of any with this agent, but again, I would uh, add that experience to date with this agent is really uh, very limited. And then, of course, uh, most recently, the TKI that was last approved uh, was uh, panatinib. And um, while skin rash and musculoskeletal discomfort has been observed with this agent. Uh, hypertension has been observed as well in a substantial proportion of patients. Um, of course, hypertension can be managed, but um, the issue of uh, serious and irreversible toxicities, I think, was really brought to the fore by this agent, um, where um, the rate of uh, vaso-occlusive disease um, is approximately 15 percent uh, within the first uh, two years. Whether or not this will be a continuous risk um, while people are on this agent, or whether people will be large, whether this issue will be largely um, uh, limited to the first few years after initiation, of course, we do not know because the longest follow-up that has been presented so far with this agent has been only, uh, well, 24 months of the phase two study. There has been longer follow-up presented of the phase one study, but the number of patients in that, in that study uh, is, of course, rather small. So um, this begs the question, of course, um, when you have these, this potential, especially for uh, serious and irreversible toxicities that may be associated with um, um, cardi certain cardiovascular risk factors, uh, for instance, um, are, are such, uh, can one argue that older individuals, and I put older in quotations because I think we, we all would debate what the definition of older is, but um, with older individuals in whom the uh, likelihood of dying due to CML um, is, is lower um, in light of the fact of the other things that are, that, uh, that, that are uh, associated with uh, age-related um, issues. Um, should, should we 
preferentially treat such patients uh, with imatinib uh, and hopefully spare them some of the uh, cardiovascular uh, and other uh, risk factors. So the thrombotic risk factors um, and, um, and you see plural, uh, I'm sorry, plural effusion uh, risk uh, as well are, are likely to be higher, as I mentioned earlier, in, in, uh, in the elderly. And some of the risk factors for these are hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and history of prior uh, cardiovascular events. Um, on the other hand, one can say, well, should drugs that have this profile even be given to younger patients because we don't know yet about the impact of having people on these drugs for years and years and years. And so I think this raises some, some important questions that we, at this point, of course, don't know, don't know the answer to. But I think this is an increasingly important area to think about um, because the longer term outlooks, uh, outlook with these agents uh, is looking generally uh, quite good. Now, I, I do want to stress that the majority of people on all of these drugs, of course, do not have any serious and irreversible toxicity. Um, but again, the, since the title of this and the focus of this was on the, this particular issue, I wanted to you know, certainly give it proper uh, attention. Um, the issue of risk factors, of course, it's important to realize that we can identify risk factors for some of these events, but of course, it's never a perfect correlation. Um, so some of these things, for instance, the cardiovascular risk factors, age, hypertension, diabetes, prior history of thrombosis, while they may be associated with an increased likelihood of suffering such an, a, a thrombotic event, of course, many pa patients have these risk factors and have not had these events. And similarly, there have been some patients who have no risk factors who have had these events. And so it's important to realize that we can never predict with 100% certainty who is at risk and who is not going to potentially have uh, one of these uh, uh, events. And again, it comes back to this issue in a disease which has a prognosis as good as chronic phase CML has in 2014. Is it justifiable to use a drug that has an appreciable risk of, for instance, a cerebrovascular accident or a stroke? Um, in a 25-year-old with no risk factors. Now, this has been rarely observed, um, uh, for instance, in patients on panatinib, um, and it does, again, bring to mind this, this, this important issue. With respect to things that we can do to try to prevent some of these issues, of course, as I alluded to earlier, for the QT prolongation with nilotinib, for instance, of course, we believe EKG monitoring can help uh, identify people at risk for that. Um, but neither EKG monitoring nor uh, echocardiographic uh, monitoring uh, has been shown to um, uh, prevent or uh, allow us to, to, to identify patients early who may be at risk for um, thrombosis. Um, there have been studies that show that ankle brachial indices, ultrasounds of the arms and the, and the legs, can detect um, changes, um, unusual changes in uh, blood flow um, in patients on t certain TKIs. For instance, this has been observed with uh, nilotinib. But we don't know yet how predictive this is for uh, eventual cardiovascular toxicity. And then, um, importantly, we don't know whether lower doses, for instance, with panatinib, the approved dose is 45 milligrams. We don't know if lower doses, such as 15 milligrams, will preserve the efficacy and simultaneously lower the risk factor for uh, thrombosis. So this is an important issue that I think we need to sort of work to figure out what's, what's an effective dose we can give to patients while hopefully minimizing the, uh, the risk of a serious and irreversible uh, toxicity. So. Um, Certainly, you know, imatinib appears to be, I think we can say with confidence, the safest TKI with the follow-up that we have. Um, we, again, we have the longest follow-up and in the most patients with uh, imatinib, but we have data, as I'm sure you all saw yesterday, that it is inferior to um, nilotinib and disatinib with respect to uh, response rates and with respect to uh, likelihood of developing transformed disease. And so, Again, there's no perfect drug here, and uh, I think it's important that all patients should be aware of these issues and should be really involved in the decision-making as far as which 
TKI they uh, that they should be uh, that they should be treated with. Um, interestingly, you know, we can incorporate these comorbidities and these risk factors into the treatment decision. But um, it's worth noting that there are really very few, if you look at the uh, package inserts for these medications, I think um, the only one that has a, a contraindication is actually nilotinib, which has some electrolyte uh, issues um, for which you would need to correct before, or if you have a patient who has a prolonged QT interval, you would not, um, you would not uh, that's a contraindication for nilotinib. So panatinib, a drug that we would probably say at this point in time appears to have the highest risk for serious and irreversible toxicity. There are no contraindications at the moment for that. Um, Bosutinib, um, as I alluded to, the experience is uh, very uh, limited. I do want to stress that panatinib is a very active TKI, but again, we need to properly manage the, uh, the, the risks and the benefits. Um, this issue comes up because I have you know, younger patients with the T315I mutation, and the question is, do you can, and they're responding very well to panatinib, but the question is, do you continue to keep them on this for 30 years or so, or do you, or do you um, consider allogeneic stem cell transplantation if there's no active T315I inhibitor um, appearing on the uh, horizon? So that uh, ends uh, what I wanted to share with you today, and I'd be certainly happy to take any questions. I would like first to, uh, to thank uh, Professor Schaff for his uh, a very comprehensive uh, lecture. And I open, uh, I open the session for uh, questions. Yes, you are. Thanks, uh, Dr. Shah. Uh, actually, it's two, two questions. First, we get a lot of quest uh, questions from our patients. Uh, about changing the treatment due to side effect intolerability. And always the question is, uh, and it also refers to you, how quick are you with changing uh, the treatment when a patient comes to you, for example, with side effects that you think he can tolerate, but the patient tells you, for example, edema around the eyes on imatinib, and he said, I just don't like the way I look, and I want to change treatment. So how fast are you in changing uh, the treatment? And the second uh, question is, uh, you didn't say anything or mention anything about nilotinib and uh, diabetic. And we do have a lot of patients who have diabetic or the sugar level uh, is increasing when they start taking nilotinib. And uh, can you refer to that, please? Yeah, so I'll answer the second question first. I did have, I briefly had something about hyperglycemia up there with, with nilotinib. Um, we don't look at that as necessarily serious and irreversible, but it can be potentially serious, and it does make you wonder, again, if you think about this as being a risk factor for a cardiovascular event down the road, we have to trade off the risks and benefits and in, in, in hypertension with panatinib uh, and similarly. Um, so I think that this is an issue that has probably not gotten as much attention um, over the years. We've known about hyperglycemia, for instance, with nilotinib for, for a number of years. It hasn't gotten as much uh, attention as, as some of the more recent um, ar ar arterial occlusive events. Uh, but I think you know we need to keep all of this, of course, uh, in mind, especially as these agents are going into patients earlier and earlier during the treatment course as, as first-line therapy, uh, potentially. Um, with respect to the question of, um, of switching patients for maybe, it sounds like, lower-grade side effects is what, is what you're saying. Um, so my approach has, has been, for a number of years, I think we've learned that patients who achieve deep responses, um, those responses tend to be very durable. Um, so the first goal in management, in my opinion, is to get a patient into a deep response. After that, um, again, because the response tends to be durable and because we're trying to um, ideally protect decades and decades of life, the issue of quality of life becomes very important. Um, of course, we can continue to monitor patients to make sure that they're responding to therapy. But um, so I have actually a very low threshold for switching patients for side effects. In fact, the, the exact scenario 
I have a colleague who's a PhD researcher at my university, um, and she had been undetectable on imatinib for years. Um, and I had only met her, you know, relatively recently, and she said, you know, you would not know this to look at me, but she said, this is not my face. You know, every time I look in the mirror in the morning, I am reminded, despite the fact that I have had a complete molecular response, been PCR undetectable, but I'm reminded every morning when I look in the mirror that, yes, I have CML, and, you know, because I have this, this periorbital edema. And we switched her, you know, for that reason, because I didn't feel like it was, it was, um, it was up to me to say what is worth switching you, what, what, what is a worthy, you know, what, what constitutes uh, a bothersome side effect. Um, so I, again, have a very low threshold uh, for switching patients. I also have, um, um, and perhaps at least with some drugs, um, um, have had reasonably good success with dose reduction. Um, I mean, I don't want to give the impression that I'm using, <laughs> I know yesterday the question came about 100 milligrams of imatinib. I don't want to give the impression that I'm doing anything like that. But with some of the drugs, I think we have evidence that we can lower the dose and maintain the efficacy and uh, simultaneously um, um, uh, improve the side effect profile. So, so to, but uh, having, coming back to what I was um, discussing here, I think we do, as we've learned, and we've learned you know, more recently about, for instance, the pulmonary arterial hypertension with the satinib and the peripheral arterial occlusive disease with, um, uh, with nilotinib. I think this, this needs to factor into the decision making you know, a little bit more. And certainly, patients need to know about this and know about what the relative risk is, what is the proportion of patients. It's not high, but at least patients need to be aware of it um, so that they are involved in the informed uh, decision process. Thank you. I, I have a, a question. Uh, I ask the permission of the audience. The question is, might be uh, relatively uh, long, but I think it is of interest for all the people here. CML is a, is a disease uh, in many cases of middle age. And the uh, people at that uh, age are uh, often suffering from other medical conditions, needed drugs for their other conditions, cardiac, hypertension, diabetes, and so on. Some of these drugs interfere with TKIs in a, manner, in a manner that sometimes they cause a raise in the level of the TKIs in the blood. In other cases, they reduce the level. Or the level of the other drugs might be high till toxicity. So if, if one takes one drug with the TKI, it is relatively easy to evaluate the uh, mutual uh, influence. But some people take three, four, five, six drugs, and it becomes very, very complicated to evaluate how one drug is influencing the others. What is your uh, attitude about, about this, and how you deal with these patients. Yeah, so the issue of polypharmacology, having patients, especially older patients, I don't want to say older meaning old because I'm, I'm in the same group as, as, as many of you. Um, so um, this issue, I think, um, is, is very, can, be, can become very tricky, certainly. Um, I think one of the other speakers is going to touch upon this. But I, I don't think there's, I have a, a, an easy answer to your question. I think um, one of my practices, I will say, in older folks, um, so for instance, if I start an older individual on desatinib, now the approved dose of desatinib is 100 milligrams uh, a day. But I will most commonly start such an individual on a lower dose because you know this is one of those drugs that I feel pretty comfortable is active at lower doses um, and probably as active. But I don't have clinical trial data to support that. Um, but you know, with the other drugs, um, it's 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 a little bit less clear. Um, so certainly, anything that interacts with uh, the the hepatic uh, uh, cytochrome P450. Um, isoenzymes we need to, and, and there's a fairly exhaustive list of those that, that, that is available. But I think for quite frequently, you know, we don't, we don't really have all that clear of an idea of some of these drug interactions. And um, what I frequently will do is if a patient does develop some type of side effect, uh, I will have the patient take a two-week break off of the TKI and see if that improves substantially. And uh, if it does, then presumably it's related to the drug, and we will either switch drugs or go to, to a lower dose and see if we can maintain uh, response. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, it's time for the for the next session. Sorry, one question, please. Can I? Yes, uh, doctor. On the topic of irreversible toxicity, uh, which may imply permanent damage to specific organs, I suppose. So, what what should be our tolerance period? in uh, determining a switch or change of treatment in the case. What would you, what would you recommend the, the, uh, the longest observation period to decide, to make the critical decision to switch or change therapy? Um, I'm not sure I understand. Is the question what, so in the event of a serious and irreversible toxicity, the question is how long would I keep how a patient on after that? How long should we tolerate? How long, pardon? Should we tolerate? before making a decision? Well, I think any time there is any one of these uh, events that comes up, if you have another treatment option, I think then, then at that point, without question, it's, it's, it's time to consider uh, another treatment option. But as I've alluded to, if you have a patient with a T315I mutation who has a thrombotic event, who doesn't have a transplant option, but is re otherwise responding to panatinib, you know, what we can do at the, I mean, uh, what we're doing at the moment is we're, we're adding aspirin and hoping that it helps prevent other events, but we have no evidence to suggest at this moment that that will be, that that will be effective. So we are switching whenever it's reasonable to, 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 another, to another TKI. Yes, thank you. Because uh, in, the, in the ELN recommendation, they, they stress on the, the, the progress or the rate of uh, response, uh, not so much on the toxicity. Yeah, again, this is an issue that I think we all need to keep in mind and keep our eyes open for because we are having younger people on these drugs and we need to think about what the long-term effects are. 